Okay, welcome everybody back to Learn at Lunchtime. Hey, I'm in a new setting. If you guys haven't noticed, I'm actually back in the museum today. So now I'd like to welcome in our fine arts curator, Amy Hammond. We've been doing artist conversations now since February. So uh, it's great to have her back again. I'm gonna turn it over to her. Thank you, Sherry, for that introduction. In honor of the upcoming Independence Day celebration, Katie McGowan and I are going to explore the dress of post-revolution Pennsylvania through portraits and historic clothing from the State Museum of Pennsylvania's collection. Portraits and historic clothing are a natural pairing when examining fashions of a specific era, and the examples we will be sharing today offer insight into the influences on America's version of Regency fashion. I'm very pleased to be joined today by curator Katie McGowan. Uh, Katie has a bachelor's degree in history from the Shippensburg University with a public history concentration and a French minor. She has a master's in American studies from Penn State Harrisburg with museum studies concentration. And she has been a curator at the State Museum since 2014. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. And um, the first slide that we wanted to show you uh, is called Franklin at the Court of France from 1778. And Katie and I wanted to begin with this engraving because it's a great example of the contrast between American clothing and elaborate European styles. Uh, the print was produced in the mid 19th century to honor Benjamin Franklin's success in securing French support for the American Revolution. And Benjamin Franklin is shown uh, at the center. He's entering a celebration hosted at Versailles by King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. And both of them are seated uh, at their, on the right side. And as you can see, uh, Benjamin Franklin looks very conspicuous in his plain suit in the room of elaborately dressed men and women. And this was a strategic decision by Franklin, but it also reflects the use of fashion to represent the Amer emerging American identity. And Katie, what is Regency fashion? And why do you find fascinating about it? So when we say Regency fashion, we're referring to that early post-revolutionary period in the United States between about 1780 to 1820. Um, to talk about dress, you might hear me use the terms Regency, Federal, Empire, even Neoclassical. Um, they're all referring to this same period of time. Um, and what I find most fascinating about clothing during this period is the uh, drastic changes that we see in fashion in a very short period of time. This era is really unique from the times that surround it. So I'm just going to briefly describe what people were wearing prior to these changes first and how we end up where we get in that um, early, in our early nation's history. Um, so this slide here, prior to the American Revolution, we are relying a lot on British and French imports um, of textiles. So those influences are gonna be the strongest on clothing that we are wearing in the United States. In the 17th century, um, Great Britain set up the Navigation Acts, which are prohibiting the colonies from direct trade with other countries. There were many ways in which people got around these laws, but um, the point is, is that materials are actually arriving pretty quickly and efficiently to the colonies after they are produced. Um, there's often a misconception that there's a great lag in time between when fashions are coming to the colonies, and that wasn't necessarily true. Um, one traveler to the colonies in this period um, observed that in the log houses of America, female dress was composed of the muslins of Britain, the silks of India, and the crepes of China. So we're getting a lot of um, materials from a lot of different places during this time. The waistcoat on the right-hand side here is likely French. Um, these were often embroidered on long panels of silk, and then they were sent uncut um, from France for tailors to finish over here, which would have saved time and money. Um, this one is a pretty, you know, um, good example of that, about 1775 to 1785. So this is just, you know, right at the end of that revolutionary period. On the other side, um, we're seeing a dress here that's peach silk. It's probably British. 
Um, originally, the fabric may date as early as about 1750 here, um, but the way that the dress is currently styled is to about 1780s. Um, this was because there was a lot of shortages during the revolution due to embargoes that Great Britain um, was putting on the United States. Um, so we see this type of restyling, fabrics are expensive, so we see this kind of restyling and recycling a lot during this period. And we also have to remember that American manufacturing was in its infancy um, in the late 18th century. There was no large scale factories that were able to produce large enough quantities of fabric for, to meet that domestic demand um, for textiles. Homespun was still kind of a cottage industry at best and was generally reserved for things like bed linens or small clothes like shirts or things like that. Um, here are two examples from our collection. One on the left is a resist dyed um, cloth fragment. And then we have a homespun linen check. And I pulled a quote from Martha Ballard, um, who some of you may have read, uh, has a diary that she kept right smack in this period from about 1780 to 1812. And she describes many instances where they are actually weaving in the home. Um, in Cumberland County, the rate of loom equipment in the home did jump from about 5% of homes with looms in 1770 to 20% in 1780. So we see a slight increase, but it just wasn't enough um, to meet that demand for clothing. So this federal period is seeing the United States struggling with forming this new identity that's independent of Great Britain. So clothing will then become a major statement of not only the individual, but the nation as a whole. And we're going to see how clothing gets interpreted in this early period of our history through some more clothing and portraits that we're going to talk about. Um, so this is our first portrait that we're going to discuss, and Amy's going to tell us about it. This portrait was painted by Charles Wilson Peel in 1789, and the subject's name is John Adlam, and his life very closely aligns with the American Revolution in a lot of very interesting ways. Uh, he was born in York in 1759. He joined a militia after attending a Stamp Act rally, and he was captured at Fort Washington in 1776. He was released. He went back to York, and he lived there for a couple of years before before he began to study as a surveyor. And he uh, was declared the state surveyor in 1789. And this painting was created in celebration of that promotion to state surveyor. And it is really meant to be an advertisement of his skills. He's holding a compass in his hands and he's leaning on a table that has surveyor's travel equipment, tools, uh, there's documents there and maps, uh, just showing the work that he was doing at the time. He is about 30 years old here, and he's looking to establish his social station among the men positioning themselves within the new nation. And um, Katie, what kind of clothing is he wearing in this portrait? So he, and again, with paintings, we're sort of taking our best guess as to materials here, but he likely has on a wool broadcloth coat and either a uh, vest and breeches or even trousers that are made of either buckskin wool or maybe even leather. Um, you can kind of see at his neck, he has a lot of ruffles going on. He might have a cravat there um, and some more ruffles on his cuffs. Um, so with these clothing, with his clothing choices here, um, in this period, we, see a lot of men taking influence from um, Brit Britain at this time. This is sort of the quintessential British country gentleman look. Um, this was the type of outfit that they might have used for sporting and hunting, um, especially using those rougher materials like wool and leather. Uh, and what makes Adlam's interpretation of this American, more American in this time period is that we start to see this simplification of menswear in this time period. Um, a lot more muted colors. Um, also, you know, fabric choices that may have been 
made domestically. Um, there's a quote that I have from a scholar here that says, plainer male dress was heralded as an emblem of liberty, parliamentary democracy, enterprise, virtue, manliness, and patriotism. Um, so Adlam's clothing choice here is modest. He's got, you know, these neutral colors going on, durable materials that are well suited to this new American climate and terrain that people are finding themselves in. And it would be an outfit that's appropriate for working both in rural and urban settings, um, which is kind of unique to uh, some Americans in this period that go from, you know, maybe having houses in the country, but yet they also have business in the city. And with Adlam being a surveyor, you can see this very well because he's highlighting his surveyor's equipment right in this painting. Um, also with the fact that he has this navy and buff combination going on, you might see a bit of resemblance here to other paintings of this time period that feature George Washington. Um, Washington was painted several times in this blue and buff combination. Um, and Washington was very concerned with personal appearance and knew that a uniform could convey many messages. And so he chose that color palette of buff and blue to differentiate American soldiers from British soldiers. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with this time period is that there's kind of a anxiety among American men in this period that are still somewhat reliant on these British and French textile imports, but also wanting to gain that independence for themselves. Um, there's not really the same kind of class hierarchy in America as you see in Europe with the aristocracy and the classes and things like that. So Adlam here is concerned about um, using his dress in a society of essentially equals. Um, and we actually have an example of Adlam next to Washington um, here that Amy was going to tell us a little bit. Because one of the things I find interesting is that Peel, the artist, is painting both of these men. So Amy, what would that say about these portraits? Thinking uh, from the perspective of John Adlam, he struggled financially throughout his life, but he was always connected. And some of his connections were uh, familial, but he also worked to build a network because, you know, he understood that this nation was developing and he was trying to, to establish his position. And uh, Charles Wilson Peel and Adlam were both Revolutionary War veterans. And uh, Charles Wilson Peel painted the first official portrait of George Washington in 1779. But the artist was well established and he remained connected to Washington throughout his life. And he also painted a number of other founding fathers. So uh, John Adlam would have been aware of this and he commissioned the pricier older artist to portray him as part of this group. So uh, you can see just by looking at these two paintings side by side that uh, John Adlam is certainly, was certainly aware of, of George Washington's style and he uh, you know, wanted to be seen as as part of that group. And Katie, was this uh, pretty typical of the, uh, the fashion at the time and what people would have had? Yes. Um, so this, this idea of like having a three piece matching men's suit is still kind of that standard coat with the vest with the breeches or pants. But we begin to see this kind of changing a little bit by the early federal period where you could have clothing that maybe could mix and match a little bit more. It didn't have to necessarily all go together. Um, so we have Adlam dressed in this buff and navy color. In the United States in particular, you see this greater emphasis being placed on these drab neutral colors as the dominant colors among men like brown or navy um, without having these settings like these social settings that you see in Europe um, bright colors are not really a necessity that's not to say they don't exist because they definitely do but it's definitely more in vogue to dress in these darker neutral colors um, I have an estate inventory here from about 1800 that shows kind of a uh, comparable male wardrobe in this period. And as we can see here with 
David Cameron. He was a Philadelphia stonemason. Um, he had in his wardrobe four pairs of pantaloons, which begins to replace breeches in this time period. So he actually has examples of both in his, in his wardrobe, pantaloons and breeches, eight under jackets, a surtout coat, an outside jacket, outside coat, 12 stockings, eight shirts, et cetera, two pairs of boots, pair of shoes. Um, so what interested me about this inventory is that he has boots and shoes. It kind of indicates a little bit of somebody who does work, but also has social interests, um, as well as the surtout coat, which is sort of considered a military coat in this time period, it would have covered up the rest of the uniform. Um, so this is, you know, pretty typical. What Adlam is wearing would be pretty typical for this time period. We're jumping back to this print again. Um, so going back to this idea of great change in fashion, we can see, you know, Franklin sticks out like a sore thumb in this picture. Um, the French court is very lavish, a lot of patterns, trimmings, uh, big hair, big skirts. Um, so we're gonna compare this image here from 1778, which are with our next painting, um, which is, of Rachel Maris and son George dating to about 1812. So we're gonna go from this look to this look in about a period of 30 years. So Amy's gonna tell us a little bit about this painting here. Uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting to switch to, to women's fashion because I think there's, uh, there's a lot going on here. And uh, this portrait was painted by Thomas Belly, <clears throat> and it's of uh, Rachel Maris with her third son, George. And it's really presenting her as an ideal mother. And the Maris family was, were wealthy merchants that lived outside of Philadelphia. And this portrait would have been hung in the family home. And it was painted in uh, 1812 to 1813 at a time when the perception of the ideal mother shifted a little bit to a more sentimental and nurturing version, which is definitely obvious here in the way that she interacts with George. And neither one of them is looking directly at the viewer, they're, uh, you know, they're focused on each other. And um, the ideal Republican mother was important to the future of the new nation because her sons would be important to the growing economy and the successful future of nation building. And, uh, Katie, how did women's fashion change during the Regency period? Yeah, so menswear is getting its inspiration from the British. However, women are getting theirs from the French. Um, and France during like the um, early 19th century becomes more of that dominant influence on fashion. Um, we can see with uh, Rachel, Rachel's dress here, an extreme narrow silhouette. We got long, narrow skirts with high waists, um, either capped sleeves like she has here or long sleeves, and often paired with draping like shawls or hair turbans. Um, I do have two examples of fashion plates from this time period. Um, so the shawls and turbans are being inspired by Eastern fashions that are being brought to light with Napoleon's um, Egypt campaign and also excavate archaeological excavations that are occurring that are uncovering ancient Greek and Roman sites during this time period. Women are digesting these fashions through fashion plates like this, as well as uh, or other early publications, women's magazines, as well as other women themselves. Um, Marie Antoinette had tried bringing this white dress look into fashion much earlier um, in about 1783. There's a very famous painting of her in a white dress that caused a great scandal, um, but society just wasn't ready for that look yet in the 1780s. Um, but she was doing that in order to come to a more simplified method of dress. Um, and this desire to simplify the way dress looked led to this neoclassical slimming down of fashion. Um, Abigail Adams is quoted as saying about fashions of this time period that dresses are made so straight before as perfectly shows the whole, whole form. And another woman, woman observer, Margaret Bayard Smith, described a woman as Madame Eve and her dress the fig leaf. 
So there's definitely this emphasis on the human body, how this, this draped fabric um, is accentuating all of those details. And the reason why we're choosing the color white here is a little bit significant too, because when they're doing these excavations, the marble statues of the ancient world, they're coming up white out of the ground, even though they would have been painted when they were you know, new. Um, so that's why these dresses are showing up as white in this time period. Um, so with, with Rachel's dress here, um, it's likely made of muslin, possibly even silk. You can barely see it in this painting, but draped over her forearm is like the most sheer shawl on it with a little bit of embroidered detail. Um, this would have been a, imported from India um, since they were considered the finest source of these sheer shawls at the time. And it makes sense that she would have that because her husband was a merchant. Um, so it's very much showing her station in society as well that she can keep up with those latest trends here. And I imagine this was probably a little bit more comfortable. Than yeah, that. definitely. Uh, women, like the, the corset, you know, women are wearing stays in the 18th century. The corset is, they had a very short corset for dresses like these, um, but definitely a lot more freeing where your entire torso wasn't um, constricted in this time period. Um, changing gears just slightly, we wanted to contrast Rachel with uh, another dress in our collection here. Um, this one is the wedding dress of Elizabeth Chapman Blackfan. She wore it to her marriage in 1822, so it's just a little bit later but still very much the same silhouette. It's got that high waist, that empire waistline, um, that long skirt. Um, and what's interesting about this is that Elizabeth and her husband were Quakers. Um, so their wedding announcement does appear in Quaker records um, of this time period. So Quaker fashion has a really defined aesthetic. Um, we see this really clearly that, you know, Rachel is choosing this gold. It's a very subtle gold color. Um, they favored m more neutral color tones. That, but what's interesting is that this dress is very, very high quality. The silk on it is absolutely stunning. It looks brand new. Um, it's not, it doesn't have all of the frills that dresses of the 1820s tend to have, but it's still really, really fashionable. The, the silhouette is spot on. Um, there's a little close up of the back of the dress here on the right, where you can see all of the um, piping detail around her shoulders and neckline. All of that, you know, doesn't detract from the whole dress, but it adds just a little bit of something to it. And she has these wonderful um, octagonal thread, threaded buttons on it, and then a lot of pleats in the back just to make her skirt fuller. Um, so while it is a Quaker dress, it's by no means unfashionable or plain. Um, and the idea of Quaker plain dress is actually very, very fitting to this time period where we see this Republican fashion sense taking over for um, you know, people in this time period. Um, so we are going to go back to Rachel Maris and son and bring in another son um, to talk a little bit about what children are wearing during this period. Um, so Amy's going to tell us about these paintings, these series of paintings. <laughs> yes, we have uh, Rachel and her son George, her third son George on the left, and this is the fourth Maris son, William, on the right hand side. And uh, this portrait of William would also have been displayed in the family home. And it really is uh, a portrait revealing his wealth and station. And of the portraits of the Maris brothers, this one's really interesting and a bit funny. It's the only one who uh, presents the subject as a mythological character. And in this case, William is being presented as Cupid and he's holding a bow and arrow and he's about to take aim on that couple in the distance. And uh, the couple, interestingly enough, are, are seem to be wearing togas, which I think is kind of uh, on the nose a little bit. 
And uh, the inclusion of mythology really aligned William with old world prestige, but it also reveals the Maris's privileged lifestyle. And uh, Katie, uh, George and William's clothing does not look like something children would wear today. And would you mind telling us a little bit about it? Sure. So George on, on the left, um, he is wearing what would be called a play suit. Um, his looks to be velvet. It was a really common garment for small children that they could wear so they wouldn't ruin their good clothes. Um, commonly, these were made from very sturdy materials like cotton or even duck, linen, things like that. Um, the play suit is interesting as a development in child's wear of this time period because it's recognizing that there is a stage of childhood between when you're a baby and when you're um, like a man, in, in a boy's life at least. So before children are dressing like miniatures of their parents in the 18th century, there wasn't really a defined phase of life when they're adolescents before they hit puberty, everybody's wearing skirts, boys and girls, um, dresses and skirts until boys get breached. Um, or they would get put into pants between the ages of three and six. And this was true way, way late into the Victorian period, even into the 20th, early 20th century. Um, there were a few philosophers during this time period, um, namely John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who believed that healthy ch child development um, were children that were freed from restrictive clothing. So the play suit gives them that freedom um, to play and grow and get strong, build up their limbs to get stronger and things like that. Uh, we typically see these being worn by boys, although girls did have an early version of a pinafore that they might have used in this period. Um, what makes these, and and to talk a little bit about William's um, dress, his is a little bit different. Like George is kind of like lazily falling off his shoulder, um, but William is a lot more buttoned up over there. Um, and he is wearing what's called a skeleton suit. You can kind of guess why that is, is because it's you know close fitting to his body, but his arms and legs remain free yet covered. Um, it was an all-in-one sort of everyday garment. Um, it's typically a little bit fancier than the play suit. So you can see his has those brass buttons and a little ruffled collar. Again, as you pointed out, going back to that old world, pulling in a little bit of that Elizabethan Renaissance rough look with that. Um, so it's, I just find that these play suits to be so interesting because they're sort of creating that period of adolescence before a child would hit puberty and they're just allowed to play and be a kid essentially. Um, we do have two examples of clo children's clothing in our collection that can kind of um, contrast these looks a little bit. So this is a boy suit um, from about 1775 to 1785. And you can see it is made very much like an adult suit would be. Um, the breeches don't survive with this um, ensemble, but we do have the waistcoat and the coat. Um, so this is like a copper colored silk it has the little trim on it. The buttons are very interesting. Um, they're actually wooden, but the jacket has been over covered with metal um, on this little suit here. And compare that with this um, little boy's play suit, which is about from 1820, um, that is made from that rougher linen material. And it's definitely designed to be a play suit. Um, it's much more simplistic in its construction, but looking at this does look a lot like William's outfit um, in that painting there. Uh, um, and the other thing that I find interesting about this outfit in particular, you might be thinking, well, with an all-in-one garment on a small child, how is that going to work? Um, there's actually a convenient little access point right in the center um, of this play suit, which I, I think is great. 
Um, and anybody knows who has kids knows how hard they are on their clothes. So this play suit is definitely a useful garment to have in the child's clothing collection. Amy, did you have anything else that you wanted to say about the William Maris painting? I think that covers it for now. Um, well, thank you, Katie, for uh, teaching us about all of these different fashions. This is really fascinating, and it really helps to add context to the portraits in our collection. And it's very interesting to think about uh, people emerging with a new American identity in, in the post-revolution era. And I think we're at a good place now to turn to a question and answer. And uh, to start, Katie, how much clothing from this area, era survives? Um, actually, quite a bit of clothing from this period survives. Um, silks, especially from this time period, are very well made. They're high quality. And they're actually a lot better um, than later Victorian examples, because in this time period, they're not being overwashed with as many chemicals as those later silks are. Um, so quite a bit of this clothing survives. I know I, there's tons and lots of museum collections around. Um, our collection is a little slim uh, when it comes to this time period, which I find interesting. Um, but generally speaking, yes, a lot does survive. Who was making the clothing during this time? Um, oftentimes you have with men's clothing, you have professional tailors that are making menswear. Um, it's believed that you needed strong hands to work with strong fabrics. So when the men's clothing is made from those, you know, very sturdy, heavy materials, that's being done by men generally. Um, women were often taking dresses to people called mantua makers. A mantua was a type of garment that was popular in the middle to late 18th century. Um, but there are, you know, seamstresses that are finishing clothing and often people are skilled enough to make their own, you know, minor modifications to their own garments as well. Um, with children, uh, those are often being made from adult garments that are cut down. They might get hand-me-downs from other siblings. Um, we see that a lot of uh, recycled things with children's clothing, um, which is interesting. It is. We have a question here about uh, Rachel Ross Maris. Is the brown fabric on her lap part of her garment or is it protecting the delicate fabric of her dress? It's a good question. Lap. From my eye, I would call that an artist prop. What do you think, Amy? I think that it could definitely be a prop. Maybe it was used to create a contrast, you know, to kind of define where her, her legs are and to, to highlight their hands together. Because if, you know, with their skin being as fair as it is, if they had their hands on her lap, it might have not been as noticeable. There is kind of a, um, a trend with paintings in the 18th century, especially. There, there's this big period of what we call faux fashion that appears in portraits, where in order to create a portrait that wasn't like super dated, you would see a lot of these like drapey, like mythical type of cloth that got draped over the figure. And that was kind of a technique. So you wouldn't be able to say, well, that portrait was made in 1760 and it's now 1780 and now outdated. Um, you see that less and less as we move into the 19th century, but it appears that, um, you know, Sully may have been going back to some of those earlier portraits for inspiration too. And uh, here's a question here um, about fabrics. In early federal America, do you know what percentage of silks used for clothing would come from Asia, India, as opposed to France or Britain? And it says that they may have been made by the descendants of French immigrants to uh, Spitalfields in London. Yes, yeah, Spitalfields was a huge, huge center for silk production. And it, it kind of comes in waves. It, it, there's periods in which Britain is importing raw materials from their colonial outposts 
Um, India was more for cottons, I believe. Um, silks were produced in very lar large quantities right in England, so that's definitely true. And they believe the reason why the French are working in spittle fields is because they believe they had the strongest embroidery skills. So French Huguenots are coming to London um, in the 18th century to work on these, these uh, and this peach dress is a perfect example of that. This could have very easily been made in spittle fields. Um, so as, in terms of percentage that's coming from Britain, they, they would have answered 100% of silks coming to America are coming from Britain. Um, but there's a lot of complicated parts that go into, you know, where the silk is coming, like where it starts versus where it ends up. So I think it's fair to say that there is a great majority of silks are coming from Britain to America. I'm glad you went back to the peach dress. Uh, yeah. We have a question here. Was that a, a petticoat quilt underneath the peach floral dress in the image? What was the last part that you just said? Was it a, a petticoat quilt underneath the peach floral dress? Yes, it was. Um, I have not verified this, but I believe it to be Marseille quilting. It was a very distinctive type of quilting that was often used in uh, pieces like that at this time. But yes, that is a petticoat underneath. I have this one styled in the, what was known as the robe à l'anglaise look, which was that open fronted robe. The French had their own version of, of this type of dress during this time period too, that was called the robe à la française. So it was always France and Britain kind of competing for those fashion, um, you know, what was gonna be the latest in fashion. So you see both styles in this time period. We have a question here about the blue and buff colors. Um, <clears throat> it says, my understanding is that those colors were worn by Whig Party anti-royalist members in Britain. And since patrons often referred to themselves as Whigs, they deliberately selected those colors for that reason. Uh, does that seem plausible? I, I don't know exactly what Adlam's political affiliation was. Um, I'm sure that that probably could have been the case once political parties become more established in the United States. And I know color symbolism becomes really big for, for that later. Um, I don't know if Adlam necessarily would have thought that when he chose this, because he is essentially modeling that off of Washington, who's doing it even earlier yet. Um, so I think it could be coincidental, but I don't know enough about Adlam's background to say yes or no to that. And uh, we have a question here. Um, was there a gender divide on pockets? And why hasn't it been updated to provide women with the same as men? <laughs> Good question. Um, yeah, that's a fabulous question. And actually, like someday I would love to just do one of these on pockets because the history of pockets is fabulous. There's a lot of scholarship on pockets out there. Um, women's pockets are separate articles during this time period. They're not built into clothing. Um, but what you have, like in the case of this peach dress, her skirt would have had slits on the side that would have been her access point to reach the pocket. But to put an entire pocket within the dress would have been too lavish for how expensive fabric was. So that's why they were separate pieces. They were always usually made from cotton or linen and they were enormous like you could fit a house in one of those pockets so i don't know that i would have wanted it to be built into the dress to be honest because it just wouldn't be roomy enough right the vest in the on the right hand side here does have that is a real pocket and it's pretty wide and flat but men actually had separate pocket books in this time period what we would probably call a wallet today they had their own version of that too, in which they're carrying their own um, personal things. So they had separate pockets as well. It wasn't just, you know, only the women, but yeah, pockets. <laughs> well, so it's cool. interesting because women's dresses now have pockets once again, many of them. So it's, yeah. <laughs> it's <come back. laughs> very practical. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we have a question here I know you're excited about. Uh, what chemicals were used 
to uh, dye and wash silk. <laughs> oh my gosh, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly answer that like in a timely fashion. It is so, the history of dyeing fabrics is so very complicated and I, I tried to go down that rabbit hole for this and you just, it's so fascinating. Like it is so fascinating. So there, the way in which fabric was generally dyed is you have to have your dyeing substance and you'd have to have your mordant to set the fabric. And in order to achieve a particular color, you had to have your particular substance and your mordant. So it's a very complicated bit of chemistry, um, but there are um, actual manuals from this time period that are online. I found a couple um, in the course of my research. So we can definitely put together a resource list if that's something people are interested in learning more about. There are primary sources for that out there. That's fascinating. And um, I have two questions here. Um, well, I'm gonna ask uh, a, one question then do a follow-up question. Uh, were men and women looking at specific sources for inspiration or how did they, how did they know what they were looking for? Um, so they're looking to each other. They're looking at people who are, you know, early adopters of certain trends. There's always fashionistas and trendsetters in all the time periods of fashion history. Um, they're also looking at these fashion plates which start to arrive in the United States directly in the 1790s. Um, there is accounts of Benjamin Frank, people like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson who are spending time abroad um, in the revolutionary period are bringing back these magazines back home um, to give to their female um, acquaintances. Uh, so they're looking to these things for inspiration. There's also, um, slightly less common dolls. They're called so-called fashion dolls that are being exported um, from Europe to colonies in which they would have little, little miniaturized models of clothing fashions. Obviously those took a lot longer to produce. And so I think generally that printed material is gonna become the driving force for this after, you know, towards the 19th century. So they're getting it from a lot of places. And what would a common man wear while hunting during this period? Um, it says, I'm assuming the buckskinner is either a myth or mostly worn among true frontiersmen rather than colonial rural farmers and labor classes. Um, well, actually I was going to say the hunting shirt is like its own thing in this time period. Um, Washington actually recommended a hunting shirt for a standard uniform for soldiers if they couldn't find anything else. Um, I don't know much more about it than that, unfortunately. Um, but I think it is fair to say that those very durable, heavier fabrics are probably going to be what you want to have when you're in a forested area, um, you know, just to protect your own self um, from the elements. So I think that's a pretty fair assumption to make. And things like buckskin and leather were produced in much greater quantity here um, than imported. The only thing that really would have been imported was the wool. Um, and that was sort of like a default uh, material choice for people in this time period was wool. Do you have a sense of how much a completed ladies dress would have cost? during this time? Um, well, I know <laughs> I found a really, really fun anecdote that when the White House was burned in the War of 1812, Dolly Madison lost all of her clothing, her entire wardrobe. And I believe she had to spend $2,000 to replace it. Um, I don't know what the conversion of that would be um, in today's time period, but I think it was like a good percentage of whatever the president's salary would have been in those days. So clothing is expensive. It, it really depends on the material that is used. Silk is the most expensive and then cottons are kind of the least expensive. Um, but it, 
when you look at estate inventories of the time period, for example, uh, where did he go? See the values on the right hand side of this um, document here is showing what his clothing is worth. So this is a really good way to kind of get a real time appraisal of clothing in this time period. When you look at old inventories, clothing is often the most expensive thing on the inventory. They might have all of my furniture equates to a small fraction of what my wardrobe does. Um, so I always find that interesting. But I mean, when you see surviving garments that have obviously been cut down and restyled over the years, you can tell that that clothing was in really high esteem in this time period. Um, and people went out of their way to, to keep it, um, you know, valuable. I'm doing a money conversion super fast. So in 1780, the date you got up there, a dollar in today's money would be worth about $197. Think about that. Yeah. And this, I believe this one, this inventory from 1800 looks like it says pounds at the top, but I'm not sure because I kind of cut it off. But oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, Katie, uh, back to materials again. Uh, Williamsburg, now colonials, Colonial Williamsburg had sheep. Wasn't the wool from Williamsburg used instead of imported wool? I guess to broaden that up a little bit, did Americans use wool from their own sheep to make clothing? Yeah, yeah, there was definitely textile production in the colonies in this time period, for sure. Um, it just wasn't to the scale that was needed to meet the demand for clothing here. Yes, we had flocks of sheep, um, but it also depended on the kind of sheep. Americans, <laughs> they were very particular about the materials that they wanted. And if our Williamsburg sheep weren't the right type of sheep to get that softest cotton that was gonna be against their skin, they weren't even gonna buy it. I, I read another account of a merchant who was really dissatisfied when his shipment from um, Great Britain came in and people wouldn't buy any of his stuff because it was the wrong color. <laughs> so they were very particular about their materials. And I think generally speaking, when something's being made domestically in this time period it is being done for personal use or on a small scale, it's not really for that mass consumption. And uh, we have a comment here. Um, says runaway advertisements in newspapers also provide a look into what indentured servants, apprentices, and a more common sort were wearing. So Absolutely. that's another source to look at if you're researching clothing of the time. And uh, did Europeans copy American fashions? It's a really good question. <laughs> I don't. I don't know that I can answer. I don't know that I can answer it. However. Um, we know that in this time period, we're getting most of our inspiration from abroad over here. So I don't know that it was really symbiotic in that way where people are wearing things in America and people in France are going, ooh, look what that person's wearing. I'm gonna copy that, that's a great idea. They're more looking at us like, hmm, that's an interesting way to wear that. <laughs> I think is kind of the general mindset. France still, you know, sees themselves as the most superior in fashion. There's a whole range of scholarship on macaroni fashion, which was men who were dressing to the nines in this time period that we can't even get into, but it's so good. Um, but I don't know that it's necessarily like a symbiotic copy for copy relationship going on at this time period, but it's a great question. It's definitely something to research more, I think. And we have a great wrap up question here. Uh, there's two. The first one is, do you have a picture of a puffy sleeve dress? Which leads me into uh, a question here. Uh, what, what, what happened next in fashion? <laughs> a puffy sleeve dress, I can only assume uh, is referring to this. Um, this is exactly right. <laughs> so this is kind of where we're headed after this time period. This is fun. Um, so fashions are always doing a 180 in the 19th century, it seems like. So 
we do the sleeves just keep growing and growing and growing in momentum through the 1820s. There's a lot of interesting technological developments with fashion in this time period where you're getting the ability, there's greater industrialization. So things are being produced in greater quantities over here. Um, there's roller printing. So fabric prints become really bizarre in some cases and we know that cotton becomes more of that dominant thing, um, which is increasing that demand for slave labor in American history um, leading up to the Civil War. So this is sort of an example of what we're gonna see in the decade following this time period that we're talking about. Um, this is when sleeves reach kind of their greatest capacity is like by 1835 and then they go back in. <laughs> so, <laughs> It, it does help us date clothing very easily um, in the 19th century. It's always about the sleeve really in this, in this century here. Um, so yeah, good question about the puffy sleeves. I like it. And, and that really links back to uh, the, um, the inspiration for this program was that, you know, Katie and I, when we're looking at the collection, we often talk about the clothing in portraits as a way to determine dates. So that's a great way to um, kind of reinforce the fact that uh, that fabric or clothing and paintings are a natural pairing. And yeah. uh, we have one more comment here. Uh, people are also adjusting their clothing for the climate uh, that depending on their location in the colonies could be a lot different from the European homeland. Correct. And even within the colonies, it's very different from uh, Massachusetts to, you know, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, thank you very much, Katie. This is a really fun uh, way to, uh, to head into the Independence Day weekend. So thanks again and happy 4th of July, everybody. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to some more of our upcoming programs. And interestingly enough, if you look at my schedule coming up here, now we have fishes next week. Um, and uh, then we're gonna hear from uh, Brad Smith about artifact legends, our director, Beth Hager. We're gonna be hearing about volunteering at the museum. But I want you to notice that on July 30th, we're gonna be rejoined by Katie um, and she is going to be talking about a parachute wedding dress that was worn uh, during World War II. I am very interested in this one. And then Amy will be back with us with Lauren uh, talking about Tecla's Ladder. So those are our upcoming programs. So please sign up for our Learn at Lunchtime programs. And we look forward to everybody having a great, uh, safe and happy 4th of July. Thanks everybody.